Hi, my name is Pat Adams, a spiritual director and blogger about the spiritual life. The consuming interest of my life has been this, how do I, how do we live a life centered in God? And yet deeper still, who am I really? What is my purpose? How do I connect deeply with God? These are the questions I will address in this video series. What is the heart of the gospel? Jesus boils down the laws that the Jews of his day followed into two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the heart of the gospel. Then he illustrated what he meant with other teachings like the Beatitudes, the parables of the Good Samaritan, and the prodigal son, among others. The Beatitudes illustrate to us what loving God with all of ourselves is all about. The parable of the prodigal son teaches us about the nature of the father. And the Good Samaritan tells us who is our neighbor. Let's start with the nature of God. We humans have been so raised at home and in school in a system of reward for good behavior and punishment for bad that we project the same expectations onto God. We rest secure in getting into heaven after we die if we've been good in following His commands, His laws, and we know that we'll be punished in hell if we've been bad. But let's really listen to what the father and the prodigal son is telling us about God that belies this assumption and belief. The father in the parable has an eye out for his son's return, even when he knows that the son has squandered his inheritance and profligate living, which basically means he's misspent his youth, ignoring all that his father had taught him. The father is hoping to see his son again, and when the son appears, the father runs out to meet him, embraces him, welcomes him home, feels compassion for him. The son wants to apologize for all he has done, to ask to just be a servant in his father's house. But his father says to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Later, the older son complains to his father about the treatment his brother is getting. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. And the father answers him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The father is not punishing the lost son. He is welcomed. He is not treating him badly because he is heired. He is restoring him to his place in his father's house. And that is how God treats us. No matter what we've done or how long we've been gone from his house, we are welcomed and celebrated, loved and embraced, forgiven and even celebrated. What God is asking of us is that we return to him, to repent, as John the Baptist said, to do a 180 turn on the world's ways and to come back to live under his influence, care and protection. Then we are restored to our natural inheritance as sons and daughters of God. Where is the punishment and lowering of status that we and the prodigal son expected? Nowhere to be seen. God knows what we go through to disengage from the world and to seek Him. He feels compassion for us, for this is not an easy task. It takes time for us to be able to absorb who God actually is, apart from our projections on Him. It takes time for us to see, and even more time, 
to feel his love for us, his forgiveness of our choices, and of the whole person that we are. But this is the lesson of the parable of the prodigal son and daughter, that we are welcome from the minute that we seek to return home, that we turn our backs on the world and its cares. The parable of the prodigal son shows God's love and forgiveness for us. Now, given the welcome on God's part, what wisdom does Jesus offer about loving God with all of ourselves? That's in the Beatitudes. Let's see the Beatitudes as Jim Forrest does as a ladder. Each Beatitude is a rung on the ladder, each step dependent on the ones before. The first one is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed means fortunate, good, or happy. And poor in spirit means that a person has come to the end of his own resources, tried everything that the culture and the world has taught her, and experienced the emptiness of it all. And he knows that he needs help to take the next step and probably doesn't even know what the next step is. She or he is ready to lean on God, to be led by his spirit, to explore the hidden side of life, the soul's life, to realize his or her own potential. So Jesus says, blessed is the person who is ready to lean on God. Realizing our dependence on God is the first step to take on the ladder. And then blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And what do we have to mourn? Our own inadequacies, our own dual nature being human and divine, our own sufferings and pain, the time spent in following the world's ways. To come to a place of peace and acceptance of all that we are, we have to face up to that totality warts and all, and mourn our shortcomings and our pain. And when we do that thoroughly, we are free of any defensiveness or projection of our own shortcomings onto any other person. We are free, now living in the present, free to discover who God created us to be and what our purpose is in His kingdom. Here is where God's transformative spirit really begins to form the person. If we leave the transformation up to the ego, it will never happen. First of all, the ego is only interested in itself, so it cannot give up that preoccupation. How could it possibly serve God? The ego is better at pushing away physical and psychological pain, using any number of behaviors to deaden it. Eventually what happens is we turn more and more of our lives over to God's healing spirit, we are transformed into loving people, and the ego, still needed, but not determinative, comes to serve the higher self for the soul. So we're building up a picture of a person who can love God with all of him or herself. First, we have to recognize our own limitations and poverty, and then the next step, we have to mourn our shortcomings and pain and suffering. The third beatitude is, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The translation of the Greek word for meek, praus, used here is gentle, meek, kind, humble, and considerate. This is the stage when the ego's dominance fades drastically, for the qualities of gentleness and humility and kindness are all about putting someone else first. Cynthia Bourgeau in The Wisdom Jesus calls this being gentled and differentiates it from being broken. She's using a metaphor from taming horses, but I think it still holds true for humans. If we're forced into obedience, we will comply, but with anger suppressed. If we are gentled into obedience, our owner, the Lord, has our full cooperation. And here is where we begin to put our whole selves into the love of and into the relationship with God. The fourth beatitude, the fourth step, is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. When we have put our whole selves into God's hands, then our hunger and thirst for righteousness becomes paramount. 
And what is righteousness? It is both acting in agreement with God's standards and being in the proper relationship with God. It is not just following the laws of God perfectly. There has to be the right relationship too. Putting God first, loving Him with all of ourselves. Here's where the very human drivers of rebellion, defensiveness, and making up for our own deficits recede to the background of our lives, and our natural hunger and thirst for righteousness comes forward. Again, healed of so many of our human tendencies, our hunger and thirst for God comes to the forefront of our lives. Our ability to rest in the mind of God comes to the fore, as well as our ability to hear His indwelling Spirit. And so we have taken the next step towards loving God with all of ourselves, and are now expressing that in everything we do. The fifth beatitude is, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The Greek word for merciful, elemon, means merciful, including feelings of pity, with the focus of showing compassion to those in serious need. Here we hear echoes of the father's compassion for the prodigal son when he rushes out to greet him. Mercy, pity, and compassion for ourselves and all others, fellow human beings in the same dilemma of trying to deal with the world and make the right choices that bring us to God. Psalm 23's assurance is appropriate here. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For that is what this beatitude promises, that those who are merciful will receive mercy. The sixth beatitude step reads, Blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. Pure, as in the Greek word katharos, means clean, pure, and innocent. And heart to the Greeks, cardia, meant the seat of the inner self, composed of life, soul, mind, and spirit, with a focus on thinking and understanding. Notice how the Greek words are close to our English words too, catharsis and cardiac. Catharsis means total cleansing and release, and cardiac related to the heart. The pure in heart are those who are no longer weighed down by their own inadequacies, their own pain and suffering, or by the shoulds and the ways of the world, now cleansed and all released. The Holy Spirit has healed all the errant human ways. The person is free to live in the mind of Christ, free of the world's stuff, fulfilling His purpose and His creation. The seventh beatitude is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. To be a peacemaker is to wholly live out the fruit of the Spirit, to bring peace, joy, love, and patience to everyone they meet, to deal with everyone with gentleness, kindness, goodness, and self-control, and to be faithful. To be a peacemaker suggests that on each side of an argument is a worthy human being who has a valid point and is treated with kindness and mercy. To be a peacemaker means it doesn't matter where another comes from or his or her race or how much status or income one has. Every single person in the world is worthy of your attention and help. Making peace always implies a deep relationship with God where all one's needs are met as they arise, so that the person may focus on the greater needs wherever he is. The peacemakers will be called children of God because they are also made of love. The eighth beatitude is, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The person who is persecuted because of his beliefs and actions in the world Expressions of his or her faith is beyond caring about his own body and what happens to it. There's a wonderful story about a bishop in North Africa in the middle of the 4th century, Cyprian. When the decree came down from Rome that all who would not bow to the emperor were to be killed, Cyprian refused and then insisted that he be martyred. He marched out to the execution place with his followers insisted that they tip the executioner because he was only doing his job, asked them to tie his hands behind him, and then stretched out his neck for the executioner. 
Here was a man who was beyond caring whether he lived or died, but only cared about doing the job he was given. Many people either saw this or heard of it converted to Christianity that day because of his peace in the face of death. To feel blessed because one is persecuted means that the person is resting in the arms of God, and that is all that is important. The Beatitudes show us the steps along the journey in the Holy Spirit that gain us the mind of Christ, each step dependent on the one before. Now let's turn to the parable of the Good Samaritan to see who is our neighbor and how we are to love him. A stranger is mugged and beaten and left by the side of the road. Two Jews, a priest and a Levite, avoided him. But a Samaritan who came along stopped to help him. He took pity on him. He bandaged his wounds, pouring on healing oil and wine, put him on his donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him there. Then he paid the innkeeper for his stay and checked back on him later. Samaritans were enemies of the Jews, considered the pagan half-Jews of the time. So Jesus is drawing a memorable example when he says that a priest and a Levite passed by the injured man and did not offer to help, but a Samaritan did. We don't know if the injured man was Jew or Samaritan, only that he was in need of help. And so Jesus defines the neighbor as someone who fills the need for another, whether he is an enemy or not, and by extension, whether he lives in our neighborhood or is known to us or by any other measure. A neighbor is simply someone who helps those in need. We have looked at two parables and at the Beatitudes, which flesh out the two great commandments of Jesus. These teachings are the heart of the gospel and the basis for all we need to know about God and ourselves. Love of God and love of neighbor are the two principles. They emphasize the centrality of love in serving God and our fellow men and women. Thank you for watching. I look forward to hearing from you soon.